Good deal. All right, well, thank you. Well, I'll kind of take and tie kind of what John kind of began with here and try and re really want some discussion into this one as well as to what you guys are doing internally through the airlines. And you'll see, because I'm going to kind of talk about <clears throat> some different aspects here, but a little bit more about me. I've been at mid, um, Argus for most of my career here. Mechanical engineer, licensed in too many states and provinces to try and keep track of. But uh, my job at Argus is really kind of oversee the quality, the processes, how we design things, and really make sure we're bringing in the new technology to try and, one, put efficient designs together, but designs that are looking at new technologies and new technologies and such as well, and to try and really ensure it's almost on the technology side, like Felicia's on the marketing brand of Argus, but I think I would be more on the engineering brand of Argus. If you see an Argus design, well, it's because we've kind of set this standard as the Argus way to do things. Um, Felicia wanted a little private th a little thing in here. I've, been a, I've got the bug from aviation when I was like seven or eight years old. My uncle had a small airplane, Cessna 170. We'd take us up as kids, so I got the bug. As soon as I got out of college, got my private license, so I've been flying for 28 years now I think so a little bit about me um, the agenda today we're going to kind of talk about one what you can do new construction in your facilities what you can do retrofit and then kind of switching gears a little bit kind of the future of aircraft fueling kind of get maybe a little too technical on this but at least kind of let you see and kind of want some if there's anybody that's kind of working on different programs because I know United and American and others have invested in some of the hydrogen technologies and such. So if you guys are involved in that, please, please speak up there. Would love to hear it. New construction, what can you do? Well, solar is a very obvious one here. This is a um, facility up in um, Portland, Maine, where they put solar panels on top of a storage tank. Well, you can do that. It's about $300,000 for this. This tank here is 100, 100 foot in diameter. You can get roughly um, 100 kilowatts of power out of that. The return on investment, roughly five years for that facility. Um, there are ta different tax incentives. I've talked to the gentleman who put this one together. Different tax incentives for different areas of the, of the country. And of course, your payback, depending on where you're at from a solar aspect, how many days or hours of sunlight that you would have per day. But you can typically get a return within about five years or so. There's also in the tax incentives, there's ways that they pull this together. These solar panels adhere or stick to the top of the tank or they stick to the top of the roof of the operations building. And you can get tax credits for recoding the top of the tank or if it's on your operations building, a vinyl roof, they t call that the, so the solar substrate and you can get tax credits for that as well. So there's some creative financing, I think, in some of those items. Next item here is on the wind turbines. So we had kind of stepping back a little bit. First of this year, we had to reach out to the entire company. It was called a call for ideas on sustainability. What can we do within our industry to come up with sustainable ideas, designs to be able to implement and to present to you guys that, hey, you, mi you might want this in your facility. And came up, the Argus employees came up with like 38 different ideas. Well, we had seven interns in the summer, so we pulled the, the top seven ideas and gave them projects this summer and go do the research on this, figure out what the return on investment was. And one of the items they went through, one of the young students we had, had vertical wind turbines. So they went through and researched this, obviously found the different sizes, different types, this being a vertical type, which doesn't take a very large footprint. Determine this is a $30,000 for a five kilowatt tower. Going through the case study here, and this happened to be they picked a spot at Chicago O'Hare and found out that they could put seven of these vertical turbines in here and looked at the spacing for the best efficiency on those turbines. But essentially that this here would pay itself off in about five years. And over the life, the 20 to 25 year life of these turbines, you're generating $130,000. So it's, is it commercially viable for you? Yes. Do some airports have the real estate for it? Yes. Others, no. We've worked on posted stamps trying to get tanks squeezed in there. Um, other items you're going to be seeing, obviously, electrical vehicle chargers. We know operators today are now ordering some of the new vehicles. Um, our operator up in Vancouver, they've got a couple of the Ford Lightning trucks on order, so we've put the EV chargers in for them. So 
very simple. You can buy them at Home Depot for 500 bucks. So it's just getting the electricians to wire those in. As the refuelers and such, you see the Tesla Semi. As we start to get larger vehicles in the electric mode, that's gonna require a lot more power. So it's really trying to do an energy study to make sure you have the power in your facility to be able to charge the additional equipment there. Now we're kind of getting some of the retrofitting. We kind of look at where is your energy usage today? And I think the largest one is probably your hydrant system pump pads when you've got a number of large 100, 150 horsepower motors out there. What can you do there? Well, just simply trying to optimize the runtime of those pumps. Over time, I think there's, <clears throat> there's probably pumps that are running at times when they should not run. So it's really trying to go out, collect that data, look at when are those pumps running and where is the demand at the, to the ramp? When do we actually need flow to that ramp? Analyzing that data and modifying some of the control logic. So simply if you can reduce two hours of pump runtime on a 150 horsepower pump, you're gonna save $12,000 a year in annual, annual energy costs there. So the payback's rather quick on something, something as simple as that. Um, variable frequency drives, I need, this is, You've probably heard a lot about this. People, hey, let's switch out your soft starters at your facility with for a variable frequency drive. And this, I may get a little too deep in the engineering side of it, but you've essentially have a pump curve here. You've got centrifugal pumps at your facility. The higher the flow rate, the lower the pressure you get. And we're trying to, when we select a pump, trying to select a pump for that system, which we have what here is what's called a system curve. When you look at your hydrant systems, think of a, a tree. So the base of that tree is the fuel farm and all the branches and such are the piping, that piping network out there. And depending upon where the fueling demands are on those branches, it affects that system curve. So every five minutes when another aircraft is fueling somewhere else, that system curve changes. So as we're designing a facility, we're trying to figure out what that system curve is to make sure we've got this operating point where you can select, select the best pump. You see this curve slopes up, that's the friction in a pipe. As you double the velocity in the pipe, that friction is a square of that. So your friction is going up four times if you double the velocity in that pipe. So most hydrant systems out there, they were designed 50 years ago, they're oversized. Your velocities are low, you have shallow system curves. So there's a lot of facilities where VFDs just don't make sense because you don't get a system curve to where you have to have a, you have to meet this point. You're always working in this flat point. So if the pump you have was picked correctly, adding a VFD gives you really no benefit. But it's trying to analyze that system to see, is it, is it something you could do at your facility? This is a case study for a pipeline where we talked about a uh, hydrant system being that tree with many branches. This was one, one branch. This is very easy to analyze. We had in our design basis memorandum for this, the owner wanted to be able to transfer from their upstream marine facility into the tank farm at 3,300 gallons per minute. Well, they only needed to transfer fuel once every two days. So it's like, well, what if we put VFDs in here and there are periods of time where you can slow that transfer down. Do you turn on two of your full speed pumps or could you turn on still three, but at a reduced frequency and try and save energy? So this was a cost savings here of going with VFDs in this facility, you could save $66,000 a year. Well, over a 50 year life of that facility, we're talking huge money to be able to do that if the operator just takes the time to realize, hey, I have two days to transfer this tank from this farm to this tank at the airport to be able to meet that demand. Of course, this is a simple one, LED lights. We're doing switch outs in facilities. You look at what an LED light is, it, for a 400 watt equivalent, it's only 54 watts. So there's 700% energy, energy reduction there you have to pretty much replace the entire fixture. As you see in this slide here, the LEDs, they have a longer lifespan. There's a higher installation cost, primarily because you're, you're putting new fixtures in in order to do that. You do have the smart ability, as you guys know, you can buy the, the Philips Hue or whatever light bulbs for your house and control them with your phone. 
you can dim these and control them as well at the fuel facility. So you're even reducing that energy usage even more to light the facility than if you're actually in an area where you, you need the light to work, then you can dial them up and get more light just when, it, just when you're there trying to see. Energy management, this is another one as well that you could work into your facilities, putting smart breakers and really trying to figure out where that energy consumption is, that usage is. Um, and then once you do that, you can track it. Here's the same plug for us. You can track that and really try and figure out where and what items you can do to try and save the energy without even knowing where it's going out on the branch circuits. You don't even know what to recommend for for savings there. So that's something I think that could be very important. Now kind of switching gears, this is the future of aircraft fueling. I don't know, is there anyone that's involved in the different, when we talk hydrogen or electric or anything like that, any initiatives within your companies? No one? Okay. So really the challenges on the, in the future of aircraft fueling is really that replacement fuel. Of course, SAF is up front here, I know everyone's doing that today. There's been <clears throat> a lot of investment in some of the speculative um, replacements as well. But you'll see here as we go through this, it's not as simple as just taking jet fuel and let's make this an electric airplane or let's make this a hydrogen airplane. Um, and some of the challenge we have is trying to deliver that fuel, whether it's electric electricity or hydrogen, to the gate. And kind of some engineering background here so when you have jet a jet a's or saf it has a energy density of 45 megajoules per kilogram i did this all in metric because the conversions are easier so you guys may be going back to college on some of this stuff but i guess keep in mind a thousand liters is one cubic meter so that's that's the easy conversion here instead of the british thermal units and gallons and whatever um, so essentially hydrogen is almost three times more energy dense than jet fuel. However, when you go to a volume, volumetric standpoint, hydrogen takes four and a quarter times the volume to have the same amount of energy. Where lithium ion battery, it takes 28 times the volume. So think of putting that on your airplane, you're taking all the seats away just to get the plane from A, a to B. And there's a difference between the liquid hydrogen and gaseous hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen, it takes less space, but it does that at minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit. So you've got cryogenics here that you need to worry about. Gaseous hydrogen at 700 bar, 700 bar is about 3,600 PSI. That's the typical pressure in the gas cylinders that you see. It takes even more volume to try and store that. So as we get through this, I wanted to do a Kind of go through the efficiencies here and then kind of look at a hypothetical flight so the newer jet aircraft engines when you get up in the 777 the 787 and the new a350 you're getting up to almost a 40 percent efficiency of fuel burn in that engine where hydrogen fuel cell taking hydrogen converting to electricity and then running an electric engine on an aircraft you're anywhere from 40 to 60 percent efficiency where an electric motor is 90 percent efficient so taking these efficiencies with the energy densities and going into a hypothetical flight, I say hypothetical because we don't have an electric 500 mile range regional jet today. But if we were to take the energy that's required to do that, for jet fuel, you're about 1400 liters or 1750 kilo or kilograms for weight, weight being very important on the aircraft. If you go electricity, it's 28 cubic meters of volume for batteries and 32,000 kilograms. So you've just taken all your load hauling capacity away. Getting into liquid hydrogen, why it's lighter, it takes more space. Same thing with the gaseous hydrogen, you're almost 10 times the amount of space as the jet fuel would take, but you are a little bit lighter weight. So looking future of SAF, the two orange ones, this is from Argus Media, the two orange ones are the two existing facilities that are producing everything else in blue is all the planned production there so it's it's big it's here you read in the news and it may just be because i google this and then it's always in my news feed so it maybe it's more popular than i think it is because google just pushes that stuff out to me but it's it's always there um but 
SAF, it is truly a drop-in fuel. It can replace Jet A. You can blend it and such. The energy density is equivalent to Jet A. There's many different processes to try and create that. I think there's eight different chemical processes, Fischer tropes and others. And depending upon the feedstock, it's going to take varying amounts of renewable energy to create that sustainable fuel. If you're starting with a canola oil or something, it's probably much easier than if you're starting with a wood chip and trying to get jet fuel out of that. So, but the energy requirements, and I've tried to do some research on this and I couldn't find anything on how much energy does it take based upon the different processes, based upon the different feedstocks to get from the feedstock to the completed SAF. So I know it's, it's massive, but I haven't been able to find the, that information to pass it along here. Electric aircraft, so Harbor Air was a client of ours up in Vancouver. They want to be the first all-electric commercial airline. Well, why does it work? They go low, they go slow, and they're short 15-minute hops. So I think this plane flew last week. It did its first point-to-point -point flight. It was 15 minutes long. Well, why does that work again? Well, drag is the square velocity similar to the friction in a pipe. You go twice as fast your drag is four times as much. So you need more thrust to overcome that drag. This is the um, Aviation Alice aircraft. It's supposed to be making its first flight any day today. Um, I think it only holds nine people or something and maybe a 400 mile range, but it's, this is the future for electric aircraft, if you will. One of the downsides to electric, if, if you're jet a or hydrogen that liquid fuel or whatever you're burning that fuel off you don't have to carry the weight anymore when we talk electric aircraft we're using that energy and we already shown that it's much heavier but you have to carry that weight the entire flight forever it doesn't burn off um, but the other challenge is trying to get the renewable energies near the airport to be able to provide the energy for that and it is quite massive Hydrogen aircraft, I mentioned this one because both United and American, you read, I think one of them was 30 million, the other was 35 million that they've put into Zero Avia. And their Zero Avia is taking like ATR 72s, I think, and retrofitting those for hydrogen. You can see in the picture in the lower left, they're essentially putting electric engines in place of the jet turbines, and then they'll have a hydrogen fuel cell that converts hydrogen into electricity. As we mentioned, the volume of hydrogen, they're taking away seats, revenue seat miles, to be able to store the hydrogen in the fuselage there. So it is upcoming. If you look at their timeline there, I mean, it's out to 2040. I think Airbus has seen 2050 on, on some of their technologies. Airbus kind of, they've got three different approaches, three different sample future aircraft, if you will. This one being the blended body which provides more volume in the fuselage there to hold that more volume of hydrogen to be able to do that. So they're working to try and do a modified gas turbine engine to be able to use the liquid hydrogen. And John touched on this one a bit, just you mentioned blue hydrogen. There's different colors of hydrogen depending upon how much CO2 emissions or if you get to green, which are zero emissions, um, in order to get to the green hydrogen, it takes the, a process called electrolysis. It takes massive amounts of electricity, almost one megawatt of electricity to convert water into a thousand kilograms of liquid hydrogen fuel. So there's a company I've talked with in um, Titusville, Florida, down near Spaceport. They make these, I say smaller units, small units that will generate 1,000 kilograms of liquid hydrogen per day, but these units are $10.2 million a piece. And you say they use one megawatt of energy to be able to do that. To kind of put this into perspective for you, DFW Airport pre-COVID was about 3 million gallons of jet fuel per day. If you were to switch that completely to hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, you would need about 4,250 megawatts of renewable energy per day. And if you use the same that Gen H2 technology, you're about $43 billion in infrastructure 
just for the hydrogen generation. That doesn't include the renewable energy infrastructure to do that. So it's, it's a massive task. I think this is definitely in the future. It may be where we're going. I think as there's technological advances in the liquid hydrogen production, this could become viable. But it's going to take new airframes and such in order to get to that point. So we kind of talked about some of the challenges of hydrogen. It's cryogenic. So thinking of a distribution system, how do you do this at an airport? From your fuel storage tank, your hydrogen system, it's not designed to handle this fuel. So a complete new distribution system, probably trucks in the near term, maybe even the long term. But as we mentioned, it's four and a half times the volume. So where you would have one fuel truck show up to an aircraft, now you would have four or five that would show up to be able to fuel that aircraft before it left. Um, currently, there's no standards. NFPA2, there is a standard for hydrogen fueling of vehicles for cars, but nothing like NFPA407, which is the, the code for aircraft fuel servicing. So nothing on the, the hydrogen yet. So there's, there's a lot of, I guess, design requirements that are still going to have to come in. As far as just transporting hydrogen, there's only 1,600 miles of gaseous hydrogen pipeline in the U.S. today. Really no liquid pipelines of any scale. They may have a mile here or there, but not much. Um, so it, it's going to take quite a bit of just infrastructure in the U.S. to try and get fuel in the world to get hydrogen to the airport. And this is kind of one last slide. This is from the Department of Energy, and it's kind of looking at what is the historic renewable energy demands for the United States and what's projected. And what's important is like in 2020, we were what about 11, whatever a quad is. I don't know what a quad is, but the important part is by 2050, they're saying that's only going to double. Well, as John mentioned, when all these companies want to go net zero, we want to take all this sustainable or renewable energy to create these sustainable fuels. I think that's going to be multiples higher than that in order to reach those goals for what we're trying to do. Any questions on all this? I think I'm close to wrapping up here. I think essentially SAF, it is the short term solution for reducing the CO2 emissions for jet aircraft simply because it is that drop in fuel. All forms of sustainable fuels, we say, require some, for, some portion of renewable energy to try and create. But there are, as we've kind of sh shown here, there are steps that you guys can do within your tank farms. And I guess that's kind of the question. Are there anything that you guys are doing on the facility side, maybe within your airlines or even facility side within airports, initiatives that you guys are doing or part of?